honor it is today to bring in somebody that I have been after for quite some time, somebody who uh, recognizes that um, rhythm is really the key to peace and enlightenment. It's uh, your connection to source. If you're a drummer, that's true. If you're a patron of the music, that's true. Uh, ultimately, in my mind, I feel that uh, in so many ways, <clears throat> the last great hope for a overcrowded planet with a lot of people that are not that tuned in is rhythm. Uh, we are um, confounded with words and litigation and a lot of trauma. And you see this in bands and you see this in the workplace. And uh, and yet everything goes away. The dust of everyday life falls away when you get in front of someone like my guest who can just shred all that <laughs> psychic, psychic pain with uh, just a few strokes. And then next thing you know, you're awash in colors and synesthesia. And uh, my guest has been all around this world playing on the bandstand to crowds big and small. He's also done a considerable amount of teaching in his career and uh, still continues to give back live from Nashville, Chester Thompson. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg show. Well, thank you very much, Jake. That's, that's uh, quite an introduction. <laughs> I don't know that well, that's where my that head's way. at. That's where my head's at these days, but you know, well, wow. Yeah, you well, know, I yeah. get it. I do. Under, I, I get you. <laughs> You know, I wanted to ask you, I I just wanted to take a, my gut told tells me that you had a chance to see John Coltrane play live. Is that true? Uh, unfortunately not. Um, he did come through Baltimore, which is where I'm from. I had just moved to L.A. and I was just funny. I was just talking to one of my friends. We played in high school band together and a few, and a few other bands, but who was telling me about the experience of having seen Coltrane live. And like I say, I just missed it. Um, the first time I saw a film of him playing, I was very surprised how physical was, how much he moved when he played. And I guess I shouldn't have been because you hear it. You certainly heard it in his playing. And that that's, I don't have many regrets. I've seen an amazing amount of wonderful artists, but he's the one I really wish I could have seen. The reason I said that, I well, then let me ask you about another cat. If you saw, I believe you might have seen him live, but I specifically wanted to ask you about uh, Elvin Jones and it, the, the sense of the thing that's remarkable to me. And I'm not saying that you were uh, even trying to replicate sheets of sound, but the thing about Train's band, that seminal band, and even anything with Elvin and McCoy was these sheets of sound that they were laying underneath providing this foundation that just kept flowing like a river and i just did you have a chance to see elvin because I, you know, I, I saw i saw elvin a few times yes can can you talk about a like a seminal memory of of i mean that man i mean ayerto told me like i mean he was just kind of a scary looking cat when ayerto first saw him, but then you know he'd smile and those big white teeth you know just mm -hmm. and, and you couldn't help but and then and then you know, he would just start flowing. And I just know, I know that that's the rhythm that we need to get back to or even increase in vocabulary. But I just wanted to um, for you to talk about how that impacted you. I, I, wow, that's amazing. Um, Yeah, okay. So I, like I said, I saw him a few times. Um, I was a major fan listening to him, you know, long before I ever saw him. And um yeah, I'd have to very much agree with, with what Ayrton was saying. You, he was he was really intense. Uh, it, it really cracks me up because him, uh, Art Blakey, who could look pretty intense as well. <laughs> I think the thing about those guys, I mean, they were professionals and they realized that they're playing for an audience. And one of the one of the things you learn early on is you got to smile for the audience. And somehow in the middle of all that intensity, they'd look up and smile and then they were back into it. And, you know, I, it would amaze me, um, you know, that, that they even took the time to smile. But yeah, Elvin, oh, goodness, I didn't try it. Well, I did try to emulate him in a way. Um, in his playing, it caused me to create a practice uh, exercise and technique. I don't know how much good it did, but what amazed me about him 
he played time, but it didn't depend on time. That, like, like you say, there was this pulse, there was this thing that you felt. And um, yeah, I mean, there's not been many other people I've heard that that have been have done that and touched me in quite the same way. And um, like for me, the thing was that I mean, one of my favorite recordings was a cassette. I bought it in Paris. It was John Coltrane Quartet Live. Oh man! And I don't. I I got a sneaky feeling it might have been a bootleg. I'm not sure because I could <laughs> yes. never find it again. But it was a live recording. And you're familiar with the, the guys trade fours or you know trade eights or trade a whole chorus. Sure. You know, for those that are not musicians, the chorus being the length of the entire song. So instead of just trading four bar phrases with, with Elvin, they would trade a chorus. They would play down the whole form of the song. He would play for the time of the, the, the song. But with him, you could not necessarily, um, you couldn't really patch a foot to it. You felt it clearly but i was always amazed when when they would all come back in it was with such precision and i'm you know and i would just be sitting there wondering how in the world did they know to do that because like i said it wasn't the kind of time where you could sit there and, and kind of patch your foot to but and in the places he would go i mean it was it was drums obviously but it was there was nothing traditional about it if anything more tribal i think if I exactly could that's what i was way. that's the word that's the word and um yeah so whenever i'd see him i was always amazed by that and like i say i even tried to come up with a way to practice where i would set a metronome and try to play exactly in time and then try to little by little see how far i could move away from it and still know where the time is still feel where the time is and I guess it, you know, I think it worked out pretty well, man. <laughs> like, I, I, I gotta, because... Well, it's 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 say it saved me on a few occasions, that's for sure, because I've I've been fortunate to play some some pretty extreme forms of music. Um, and I think developing that kind of sense of time, I just I just knew that he had this feeling, accurate time, but that didn't require him to play traditional time. And I, I was really hoping to accomplish that, you know. I mean, let me ask you a question because, you know, 2D Heath, rest in peace, you know, he said like Blakey didn't have the greatest technique in the world, but he was like a tribal player and the pulse was there and the feel was there. Um, like Elvin was not, um, it was just, I guess, you know, ultimately what would be part of the issue that I, when you listen to these bootlegs live from that quartet or even with Joe Farrell and Jimmy Garrison later after train passed. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> part of that process is being able to leave your thinking mind and enter the spirit mind and, and get and for a musician getting out of their thinking mind. And after that, you're sort of, then you're in the flow. And I just wonder if you were able to translate, I know you did a lot of, I don't want to say soul, but you were doing R&B and organ jazz. Were you able to, uh, I guess the point is that it comes down to trust. Can you, can you, can you do those sheets of sound with people other than those that you just have been playing with and you have uh, almost a telepathic, when I, wa when I watch you with, with Al Johnson or, you know, uh, it, it, it just looks like you guys are in a total, total telepathic state. And I just kind of wanted you to talk a little bit about the trust, because I see a lot of younger drummers today, a lot of younger bands in general, through no fault of their own. They're always concerned. Where's the one? Where's the one? Where's the one? You know, where do we come back? And the magic of music to me is the collective loses the one, but then they all come back in at the same time. Right. Well, yeah, you got to know where it is to lose it. <laughs> okay, That's so, right. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that is a question I have asked so many times in rehearsal. It's like, so where's one? <laughs> you know, because uh, you know, you know, that, I mean, it, I mean, we, we got to have a, a starting and finishing point. Um, and once, you know, in rhythms, I mean, it still fascinates me that in our system of music, there are 12 notes and the amazing variety and creativity that can manipulate those notes in so many different ways. Rhythm, uh, 
is even more expansive because we don't have 12 spaces. We've just got, I, I dare say, infinite spaces. Um, it's a matter of how we, you know, contain it within a certain framework. Um, but yeah, it's it very much a, a case of trust. Um, you know, jazz is it's, it's, it's a funny kind of thing in a sense that, um, you know, it, it's history, it's origins were not totally acceptable by everyone in the very beginning because it's it's not it's not pet you know i mean rhythmically yeah you move you definitely touches you but it touches on a much different level much depends on it i mean some of it can go so deep it, it loses me even and when i play and you know for me there's a difference when i'm in a jam session with with just musicians maybe no audience and we can go places that I might not feel as comfortable going to with an audience because, I mean, I like for the audience to feel like they're a part of what's going on. So I don't ever want to leave the audience behind. Um, but at the same time, I do really enjoy those times when that's not an issue. I mean, you know, and, and there have been those. I mean, I got to play with Weather Report, uh, like you say, with Alfonso. Alfonso and I go back to 1969 was the first time we played together. I just want, I need to ask you though, this is so, I mean, dude, you have no idea how geeked up I am to talk to you because I have to, add, I'm thinking, I mean, Philly and Baltimore weren't that far away and he <laughs> was in that band with a guy who I wonder if you knew Sherman Ferguson, the Catalyst band. Yeah, I didn't know I didn't know Sherman well, but yeah, we did cross paths a few times. You know, when I moved to LA, and you know, got to know him a little bit. So um, Al came down to Baltimore. How did you guys originally connect? Him? Because he was <laughs> this is unbelievable. Well, it go it gets crazier. So basically, uh, there was a there was a concert promoter in Baltimore decided to get into management. So they took on these two groups. I played with one, Alfonso played with the other. These, this was sort of pop back in the day. He was 18, I was 20, I think. And uh, someone, they, I think the, one of the people in the company had been in Montreal and Alfonso was playing with some band there. And I guess they got, got to talking with him and he was thinking of coming back to the States, not totally sure what he was gonna do when he got back there. Oh. And so they invited him to, to come to Baltimore and play in one of these groups, which he which he agreed to do. Well, we 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 uh, rehearsed in the same place. So between our rehearsals, these two bands, him and I just hit it off musically and we would just jam and jam and jam. We just Oh my god. And we would just every every chance we got. And a couple of the other guys in the band, neither one of neither one of whom was with us anymore, but we would just get into these, man, just really fun, wonderful jams. <laughs> and to this day, when it, when possible, we still call each other into the gig, you know, when, when it's possible. Because um, it, it's just, yeah, you know, we don't have to talk about it. We just, we just know. I, I love this. I say I we can predict where we're going, but we trust each other, you know. Okay, well, I want to read this to you, and you can extrapolate on this. Um, this is from... Um, my first interview with Gary Bartz. Uh, did you play at his father's club, by the way, at all? I unfortunately played the very last gig that ever happened in, in his club. The club. I'm sorry, you, you did get a chance. Okay, so it was the last Just gig. The one time it was called the North End Lounge. Uh, yes. You know, I, it was one of my aspirations because my very first drum set lessons were all jazz. It was a, a family friend who had done all of the pop soul music stuff and didn't want to do anything but jazz anymore. So, uh, you know, by the time we, you know, I was playing, you know, just started taking drums in school. And he said, well, if you ever want any lessons, you know, feel free to come over. He had no idea what he was asking for. <laughs> as, soon as, soon as soon as school was out for the summer, I was ringing his bell at nine o'clock every, every morning. Every morning, dude. Every morning. And he was very gracious. Uh, he taught me by, he would put on these albums by people like Miles and Max Roach and, you know, uh, Art Blakey. And teach me how to play along with these recordings. Taught me where you know, you know. Taught me about where to put the ride, you know, to, to get the feel. And taught me how to count fours. Taught me one of the most valuable things I could have learned at that age. I guess I was twelve, maybe well, thirteen when it got really serious. And he said to me, "Okay, make sure you learn the melody. So when these guys start so long, you don't get lost because they're so improvising over the form of the melody, you know, over the chord right. structure." Right. 
And so I learned to do that at a very early age. Baltimore in those days, there were sometimes four jam sessions in a week. There was never less than one or two. And the top players would come out and play. These guys just love to play. And I'd get to sit in with them. And, you know, some of the drummers would give me pointers if I was going in the wrong direction with something. And, you know, and of course, the first gig I was at, you know, my teacher's house, his name was James Harris. I was at his house and someone called him for a soul music gig he wasn't interested in. And he was about to hang up. And, and uh, you know, back in the days when you had handsets on the phones, he put his put his hand over the over the handset and say, hey, man, you want a gig? And it's, well, of course I want a gig, you know. So he tell, you know, said to them, OK, I've got a drummer for you. He's 13, but he can handle it. And so we arranged an audition. He took his drums down. I didn't even have a set yet. And uh, they liked my playing. So family got together and got me a drum set. And I started playing that weekend. <laughs> and played, oh played from the summer between eighth and ninth grade until I graduated high school. I never went to parties, never had girlfriends because I wasn't going to miss a gig, you know. Dude, this is my so wait, did you I know, I know Ahmad Jamal joined the union at 10 years old did you have to join the union or did you just uh, not, I, I didn't join until I was 18 you know when I graduated high school because we were getting ready to start doing some touring like you know just clubs and stuff you know it was, it was, most of it was cover bands but by the time I was 15 I was in an all jazz group and, and we got to play the North End Lounge unfortunately as it turned out we were the last group to play there uh but, You're you know, gonna tell. I, I wanted to go on a limb here. This is one of the guys that has been in my soul. Uh, he, I didn't get a chance to talk to him, but O'Donnell Levy was that. The, oh man! I, I mean, I mean, seriously, Chester. Like, like I, I played that for one of my one of my friends who's who, a great guitar player, uh, road dogging it as we speak, and um. He's like, man, I think this dude's nastier than Grant Green. I mean, that dude was, he was the nastiest player. And then this other guy who, I don't know what happened to him, was Fats Theus. And I'm like, oh, man. This, wow. I'm like, Chester is, the, I'm like, this is where the rubber meets the road. And the other guy that I feel like, the other cat, who I don't know if you uh, jammed with, but I interviewed, I got to send you this interview, is Charles Covington, a total magician, dude. Oh my goodness! Okay, <laughs> now, break it down. Get, I need. I mean, now, I just go ahead. Now you're getting deep into my history. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Donald unfortunately is not with us anymore. Uh, him and I, we grew up in the projects in Baltimore. We actually started out playing marbles together. <laughs> so beautiful. Man. And uh, he had an acoustic guitar, and I didn't have any drums, but there were these talent shows, and he would form these groups, and they'd be singing, and I couldn't sing a lick, but. You know, but I'd set up cardboard boxes at, at, at the rehearsal and play because I knew what went where. I just didn't have any drums. And, um, and you know, we, we'd do these talent shows, and I was in the group because they knew one day I'd get drums. But as soon as we start, as soon as they start singing, he'd lean over to me and say, just move your mouth, don't sing. <laughs> 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 but him and I go back, I think I must have been, oh, goodness, probably... 11 or 12 when we oh first met gosh. we must have been in at least 10 bands together the last one we were in together was in fact uh charles covington and, and o'donnell and myself and sometimes andy ennis who was ethel ennis brother yes. would play with us oh my goodness and we and we were ethel's band for quite a while as well and um oh Are man. You, uh, please tell me you're please tell me there's some recordings of that band I cannot believe. No, the, well, the first the first couple of Alpha, of, uh, of O'Donnell's albums, it, Charles and myself are on, and you know we well, just. Black, I mean, Black it. Velvet. Black Velvet is probably the nastiest funk jazz album that I've ever heard in my life. I mean, it's oh, one. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you? I mean, I guess you were, but you, so. Probably. Did you, yeah. Well, I mean, him and I started playing together. There, there was a guy in the neighborhood who played and, and you know, did uh, he did frat parties and clubs and stuff. Uh, he had heard o O'Donnell sort of sitting on sitting on a fence or something with his acoustic guitar and, and invited him to come around and start teaching him songs. And he started playing with him. Uh, they started including including me. Um, I would have been 12 at the time. And I didn't even have a drum set. I just had a snare drum that I borrowed from the school and uh, that I would take home to practice. So I would put like a little uh, little paperback, you know, book on, 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 on the edge of the drum. I'd kind of hit that for the bass drum sound because it was a little deeper than hitting, hitting the middle of the drum. 
and I'd end up doing a couple of frat parties with with them. <laughs> and uh, then awful. once I did have a drum kit, it wasn't the very first gig I did, but there was a neighborhood sort of bar cl club that always had bands, and we played that for quite some time. Um, so yeah, so that that's where we started being in a band together. But again, we we ended up. I think the last thing well let's see we did jack mcduff together we went we, we were in mcduff's band together and um then we were uh i was i ended up living with a band and living in boston for a short period playing with a band up there and he had gone on to california with jimmy mcgriff i think at that point and uh on my return to baltimore and his return from california we got back we both needed to come back home and um so then we got together with Charles Covington, who we played with off and on, but then we formed a group and started taking it pretty seriously. And um, so, I mean, my culture shock, one of my craziest memories is Saturday night being at this club in Baltimore in a pretty rough part of town that if had not been a gig, I probably wouldn't have been hanging out there. <laughs> but the band was um, Charles Covington, O'Donnell Levy and myself. We had a singer named Judd Watkins, who was phenomenal. Oh. He's now gone as well. And um, we, man, we were doing not so many originals at that point, but we were doing like lots of uh, Herbie Hancock and Miles and I mean, really, really intense tunes. And then that, then that, then the last weekend I did that, Monday morning, I'm in a rehearsal with Frank Zappa, <laughs> with George Duke and uh, people that I would have thought of as hippies that played like nobody had ever been with before. It was pretty, talking about culture shock, it was pretty amazing. Wow. I mean, um, this is the quote I wanted to read to you, and then I want you to riff on it. This and because okay. this is this is kind of the this is the, this is Baltimore. This is from Gary Bartz. He goes, "I grew up in a segregated city. Mm -hmm. We all went to black schools, but they had a white principal. The stores we went to might have had might have been in a black neighborhood, but they had a white owner. Right. During segregation, you had to have certain businesses." You had to have them because we were not welcome in other establishments. So we had our own movie houses. We had our own grocery stores. We had our own hotels. When I went to New Orleans with Max Roach for the first time, we stayed at the Marcellus's Hotel in Baton Rouge. We couldn't stay mm -hmm. in downtown New Orleans. And I guess, you know, it, you were 12 or 13 and just kind of just having a ball in life. But I, you know, when you listen to Curtis Mayfield, when you listen to Donnie Hathaway, when you listen to Willie Hutch, when you listen to O'Donnell Levy sing, it's like the messages are full of hope. It, it, and they're actually, they're, they're social consciousness messages. And the music is so happy. And I just wonder, <clears throat> not that, des I mean, listen, desegregation as an ethical thing, uh, it makes sense. But do you feel like there was more cultural um you know sort of gelling uh because of the fact that there was this segregation and do you feel like the music in your case grew because you guys were i mean let's face it i mean that's 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 so hard for me as a 46 year old to really comprehend but yet there it was i mean ron carter would walk into a store in detroit some cat who who had white skin would walk in, get something for two bucks. Ron would buy the same thing. It'd be four bucks. And I just mm -hmm. wonder in your mind at that time, so much of music at that time in my mind had a social justice component to it. And even pop music did. And I just wonder how much that affected you, if at all, or you just were trying to sing for your supper. And, you know, that wasn't really a, a front burner issue. for you. Okay. So, oh man, you're covering a lot of, a lot of stuff here. So first of all, it's been long established in history that that great art comes out of oppression. Right. Okay, um, and that that's existed in so many cultures. Look at Brazil. I love Brazilian music, but what a mess! <laughs> you know, uh, You're darn right, it's, man. It's, it, you know, it's probably better now, but politically, it still goes back and forth. I mean, the first time I went to Brazil, it was still under a dictatorship. You know, um, but look at the music that came out of it. Oh my goodness! Um, and so I think that's that's kind of a that that's just I think one of the facts of life just you know, within human nature you know because like yes yeah there is that hope there is that um and artists tend to um oh goodness 
Yeah, there's there's just something about it. Well, I mean, for me, I you know, well, it looks, sounds like this is a pretty no holds barred conversation. Uh, <laughs> so, dude, cut it loose, man. Yeah. Okay, so ba basically, I mean, yeah, I'm just reading your your, your thing about. I've, I've I've looked through a few of your interviews. I'm man, oh my goodness, you. <laughs> it's a deep dive. You've been, man. You've been very busy. <laughs> Thirteen years, man. You know. Oh just, man. So, you know, but I mean, honestly, it's it, you. It, it's a never ending well of enlightenment but yeah go ahead man Riff okay away. so okay so from my perspective all right first of all i'm coming home from school little black and white tv before we ever had a color tv um and when i come in from school I, you turn on you look at the news all i'm seeing is fire hoses dogs attacking the the uh you know civil rights leaders uh, seeing people being hit with eggs and rocks and you name it um so this is what I'm having to contend with every during the day. Then as it's moving in Baltimore, there's things in the news like the swimming pools that blacks had never even tried to go to before because they knew they weren't uh, welcome started showing up. And so you get the fist fights and all the things that, that went along with that. So you do grow up with a certain, uh, I was, probably was a little tiny bit militant at one point because you just, you know, you enjoy where you are, uh, you know, blacks in general, are pretty loving people. Um, oh, I, worry about, the world, I, man. Yeah. I worry about some of the younger generation because they're just being influenced by so much crazy negativity and media induced neg negativity in some cases because, you know, well, uh, I mean, I happen to know when I was living in L.A., I knew of a, a video that was made by you know a young group they were in the early days of hip hop and all that and the record company refused to release it and were to, and they were told to no no you got to make it more violent you know um Jeez. so so you got that kind of influence going on at the same time um so but your joy is when you sit down and play music and communicate and i don't know that i was socially well when you're playing you just you get you just get in the zone and, and you just love to play and, and make music and you know groove is a groove you know um and so that that's it's creative it's almost an escape in some ways um and the let me ask you let me ask you it, something it, it, it can touch it can touch people in that deeper way and bring hope and, and you know and, and give them a break from from all the negativity you know so chester let me ask you like to me you talk about growing up in the in the neighborhood in, in Baltimore that you did um I guess maybe the better question is was music seen as a viable profession to get out of the neighborhood I mean obviously did you go on the chitlin circuit I, I think today <laughs> it's it's like today I mean, I mean I don't care what color you are a musician unfortunately in my mind after doing all this woodshedding it, you know, it's not seen necessarily as a viable profession. It's seen as um, music as a musician's gift to the world, or you can pay to play, or you can play for the door. Whereas you go back to when you were starting up, I mean, cost of living wasn't that high, but there was also this massive touring circuit in all genres mm -hmm. of music. So you could actually make some bread. And so I guess maybe the hope was there. Yes, obviously you sit down at the kit, start to groove. It's starting to feel good spirits moving through the room but did you see it as a gateway towards a profession um yes and no um the dream i guess was there my mother showed me a letter i wrote in fourth grade one of those what are you going to do when you grow up things and i can't find it unfortunately but it outlined my whole career when she showed it to me as an adult you know after i've been touring and, and recording and stuff it brought tears to my eyes because it really laid out my career um, wow. it was a childish dream, I guess, at the time, oh, obviously it was a bit deeper than that, but at the time that wasn't my MO. I mean, I just loved to play. I just played music cause I loved to play it. And whether I ever got out of Baltimore or not, I don't, I don't think it would have mattered. I mean, mm. who can say you can't go back, but I just love to play. And, um, it was such a joy to sit down and play. Um, yeah, fortunately now at the same time, Baltimore had a theater. You know, the Apollo was not a standalone situation. There were theaters in several cities where those shows would travel to, to these different cities. And Baltimore had one of those theaters. It was called the Royal Theater. 
So um, I saw everybody. I mean, I saw Sam Cooke. I saw early Motown. I saw little Stevie Wonder, um, The Temptations. Yeah. I saw, you know, Sam and Dave. I saw everybody. I'd go try to sit close to the front and watch the drummers as they come in and, and play the stuff. A lot of guys, you know, not every group brought their own rhythm section, but but I st started going to these shows at I guess probably around 13 and in, until I almost until I left Baltimore, I guess they kind of shut down uh, at one point later. I was probably 18 or 19 before they shut down, I think. And, um, you know, just because it was just weird, you know. Uh, I'm not sure why it shut, why things shut down, because they they certainly packed the houses. Um, but so for me, the you know, I definitely got to see that. Yeah, these people are, to my you know, my way of thinking, they were making it, you know. Um, so there was that dream, of course. Um, at the same time, it wasn't my main concern whether I. Of course, you want to make it, but the playing was just you know, you play for nothing if it comes down to it, because you love to play. Um, wow. So it wasn't like I refuse to play if you don't pay me a certain amount. Over the years, you know, with cost of living and a, a family to feed, yeah, you got to sort of set some, you know, parameters. But, um, but no, the, I think, and, and I'm, I feel extremely grateful that the love is still there. I still love to play the drums. Um, Charles Covington is what is he eighty? Oh my God, the mat, He's a magician. We, the we still we, we still talk. We Charles and I still talk. He's still doing gigs. Uh, he taught at, at um, Howard University for several years and directed the jazz choir there for several years. Um, he's he's still, you know, he lost his wife uh, about a year ago, a couple of years ago. And but he's still hanging in there. He's still doing music. He's a he's a you know, he's a registered chess master as well as all the other stuff he does. You know? And the guy is amazing. Yeah, we we still talk. We still, you know, get on the phone for an hour at a time, you know. <laughs> I just want to be clear because this is the most mind blowing thing is that the band that you put together <clears throat> um, when it was basically guitar, drums, and him playing organ and kicking pedals as the bass player. Unless I mean, it, he basically was playing bass, bass lines. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, coming, coming, <laughs> coming. Well, okay. The, what most people don't realize: very few guys played pedals. That's right. You know, it's left hand bass. They use pedals to accent, you know, the, the diff, you know, different notes, maybe the, the roots of the chord or something. Charles Covington, how, however, you know, when he was feeling playful, sometimes he'd lift his left hand up and scratch his head while he'd run the bass, the bass line with his feet or even play <laughs> solos with his feet. The guy was unreal. He's unreal. now taught himself to play guitar. He's playing some pretty decent guitar these days as well. Oh, um, yeah, Charles is like a freak of nature, man. <laughs> Do you feel like um <clears throat> like like those bass lines were diff I mean you you know well that's the other thing I mean I want to I want to really hone in on this because you were sort of on the periphery of it but it's you know it, it was revelatory when I interviewed Eddie Henderson uh mm -hmm. he was at Howard and literally he's practice he's blowing in the practice room he's playing his trumpet and he's playing Miles and Lee Morgan and all this stuff Mm -hmm. And the and the security guard comes in with a gun, and he says, "Don't you play that? I'm not going to say the word music. That, I mean, dude, Roberta, Roberta Flack. Did, she went to Howard, but they didn't teach jazz there. No, I mean, they didn't. It, no. they did not. They saw that as the devil's music. And I, I want, <laughs> and I just wonder, like, I guess to the point, like, <clears throat> uh, and." And I and I've interviewed so many cats who did come out of uh, devout households, uh, and you know they couldn't practice boogie woogie or the blues when their parents were home. Uh, mm -hmm. They, you know, and I just wonder about really you came up at this time when, and then obviously Donald Byrd came into Howard in the early '70s and sort of changed that whole program. But I mean Eddie Henderson literally, the the, the guy said, "You better stop, or I'm going to shoot you." I mean this is like. Yeah. And, 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 you know, O'Donnell, I mean, you listen to granny, that tune on black velvet. I mean, <laughs> that is just the greasiest, that's not bebop or, you know, that's like soul. So, I mean, were you, I mean, I don't even want to say aware, but like, did you recognize that that was, that that kind of music was possibly more palatable to the audience than what was considered still? I mean, it's, 
it's always jazz is always never has it's been hard to be recognized by the people who actually created it. Well, okay, so my mother, like I say, people would ask her, how can you let that boy play clubs when he's 13 years old? Right. And she knew me. Um, I was the kid. Um, I was, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't a tough kid at all. Um, and I, I loved learning. I mean, my library card was my prized possession from, from the time <laughs> I was eight years old. I just loved to read because I could go experience all these other cultures and things you know, even though I'm living in the projects and, you know, I'm the wrong complexion and, you know, wasn't a tough guy. And, you know, I had, as, as they call good hair. And so the, the young ladies liked me, but which wow. a lot of guys didn't, um, you know, uh, oh, they were jealous of you. Yeah. Well, I was very shy though. So, I mean, I never took any of that, you know, I mean, I think by the time drums came along, that was kind of like my, it was my, finally I found my thing, you know, yeah. um, my romance. But, yeah. But my mom, she had no problem with me playing the club. She knew I wasn't going to be a drinker. She knew if I saw the kind of behavior that that's that's inspired by drinking, I, it, it wouldn't be something. Wouldn't be for me. And um, but she loved music. Oh my goodness, my mom loved music. I mean, some of my favorite memories of her in the kitchen singing various, you know, Christian hymns. Um, and you know, I mean, we, you know. You know, I, I kind of walked away from it at one point as a teenager because I'm out playing clubs and being around all this stuff. But my wife and I, you know, we've been married for 46 years. We became Christians in 80 and we really try to walk the walk, um, which means, you know, you know, unfortunately, the media version of, of Christians and stuff like is, is, is miles light years away from what it's meant to be and what it's supposed to be. And, um, you know, I want, this is really important because I feel that sincerity and I talk to a lot of very beautiful people of Christian faith and, and the media does paint with this broad brush at a very superficial level. And I, I, you know, I, my feeling is like, maybe you kind of, um, walked away from it or what, you know, you, you were truly young and trying to sing for your supper and you were in mm -hmm. nightclubs all the time, but. Do you feel like you always had a connection to to God through? Oh, yeah. You, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I mean, I've never not known where it came from. Right, right. You know, I mean, you know, it's not like before you're born, you go through a checklist. I think I'm going to be this. I think I'm going to be that, you know. No, you, you, you have a talent, whatever your talent happens to be. Um, hopefully with some reasonable instruction, you will realize that a talent is a very precious gift. And it's to be taken care of and, and cared for and cherished and nurtured. Um, you know, there are those we see that have an incredible talent and they think it's all due to their own selves and their egos usually get them kicked out of a lot of doors. Um, you know, no, I mean, even musicians that don't appear to believe in anything, the first thing they'll tell you, man, when you're playing, you got to get out of the way and let it come through. Right. They don't necessarily discuss where it's coming from, but, you know, I knew where I've always felt like it's a God given thing and, and to not be taken lightly. Um, you know, there, I mean, like I say, being young and stupid, which we, I think we most of us go through some phase of that, you know. Oh, uh, come on. Of course. I, I'm, it was there. Was know. there was there a time when like <clears throat> you say you've taken it seriously? Um, was there a seminal moment like. I don't know, even around the Zappa times or, or you know, where you were, uh, you, you really got it reinforced to you to take it to, I mean, I remember Jim Keltner, who I've done a bunch of interviews with, you know, he, mm. <laughs> he, you know, the long and the short of it is that, um, you know, you get involved with substance abuse, you get involved with, um, you know, the debauchery of the L.A. scene was just out mm. of control. The 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 amount of stuff that was going on late at night and, you know, Harry Nielsen albums stumbling out at six in the morning. And, you know, it's it, and then and then his wife is ready to leave him. And then cosmically, mm. the phone rings and Bob Dylan wants him to come on tour. It's a long story, but wow. it reinforced his fate, his his belief in in God. And, and I just wonder, was there. Was it leading up to 1980? Was there a break? Was there a point where you're like, I have to surrender to something to, and I have to commit to oh, something? Oh, goodness. 
Wow. Yeah, there it was definitely. Well, you know why? Because I just want to say this: like a lot of the cats, like Michael Shreve, Johnny McLaughlin, Larry Coriel, like those guys were all doing hard drugs in the late '60s, uh, or you know, and they all were seeing friends of theirs becoming roadkill, and they wanted mm -hmm. to live, so they yeah. they sought out other, you know, Sri Chimnoyer, Maharishi, or uh, mm -hmm. these these gurus. But you know, uh, faith is just a very especially for somebody who's playing i mean you're not playing formula trip music chester i mean like this is like the most spiritual music in every form that you could play and you realize that when the only time that it really feels right is when you're it, totally out of your own way that your ego is not anywhere near there and uh i just in the 70s was it building up because you know i don't know if I want to talk to Alex, uh, the last interview he talked, had you left, was, was Jocko in the band when you were there or no? I just wonder about no, like jo Jocko came <laughs> in, it, this, it's doing the switch from when we did Black Market, Alfonso ended up leaving because he had been promised membership in the band for years. And they had new management who uh, decided that absolutely not they should Joe and Wayne should not uh, share membership huh. and so he was a little frustrated with that and uh it all happened over a Christmas break I had gone to Baltimore for Christmas um so uh, these things happened I had no idea as it turns out you know Fonzo had left which I didn't realize um and then they were you know seeking out bass players well and that I mean I, yeah, they, they decided on Jocko uh, so I get back not knowing that they assumed without asking questions <laughs> that because Alfonso and I were so close and they recognized that, that we were leaving to start a new band, which is pretty much what Joe and Wayne did. They left Miles and Cannonball and started Weather Report. And um, they were assuming we were doing that, uh, which was not the case at all. No, I, that's, I, I mean, that's absurd. Uh, assumption. Well, yeah. that's. You know, that's just what they. You know what they say about assume. <laughs> I know, believe me, I run into it all. The, I, you know, I still right. stumble so and, all. Yeah. Right. So I get there, and um, I, you know, I get back to LA. I call up Wayne. I say, you know, I'm back in town. When are we going in the studio? And I get a message back from Wayne. Uh, you know, answering machines were pretty amazing because you could really hear things that you wouldn't get when you're looking at a person. And right. Wayne's response was something like. Well, we're going in, you know, uh, tomorrow or a couple of days, whatever it was, but don't bother to come in. It's like, that was very strange. So I called Joe and Joe, I uh, tell Joe about this message that Wayne just left. Say, well, didn't you quit the band? I'm like, no, what are you talking about? And uh, well, we, we thought you quit the band with Alfonso when he quit. It's like, whoa, whoa, wait, back up, you know? And um, so, it's like, you know, well, then because they asked Jocko, who do you want to play with? And he said, no, to Michael Walden. And um, so they said, OK, go for it. And it's like, well, and so Joe said, well, if you didn't quit the band, then, you know, you know, because I was saying, man, well, what if I come in and, and play percussion along with Alex? Because, um, you know, I had no idea this was going on. And really, I bought Christmas presents. I need to work. I need some money, man. <laughs> And Joe says, well, come on in, play percussion along with Alex. And um, I had no idea how out of my league I was with that. I mean, like I said, Alex and I have been playing together, you know, drums and percussion for the last six months or so in the band. And um, so I go in and, you know, Narda shows up and he sees me there. It's like, what are you doing here? So well, I'm in the band. He said, well, they told me I'm in the band. <laughs> it was a very, very awkward moment. And uh, so Narda did play on a couple of tracks. He got credit for black market, but but that's which is totally inaccurate. Um, if you, next time you hear black market, if you listen, when it gets to the bridge where it changes to a sort of a swing feel, there's a difference in everything. The, the difference in the sound, the reverb, the drum sounds. They kept my first half of the song and then spliced on his second half of the song. Whoa, whoa! <laughs> it, we on the, you mean on on the title track? On the title track, yeah. On the, the title track, the yeah. whole opening is me. And then when it goes to, you know, the bridge thing, then that's that's Narda. And if you're listening, you'll hear the sound of everything change at that moment because it's a different day of recording. And uh, so and, and he played this. He played on a ballad called Cannon, which he played beautifully. I've got, you know, I mean, the guy's a great player. You got to give him his, give him his props, you know. And uh, so anyway, we tried rehearsing with Jocko and me. Um, 
the field that Alfonso and I got, um, I guess there's a subtext to it, which is as a result of us growing up East Coast, you know, playing soul music and, and you know, this more soulful kind of jazz. Uh, the subtext is a 16th note triplet, uh -huh. so, you know, which is like, which gives it that bounce, you know, which gives it that that other kind of thing. It's not straight, straight music. Oh, I love it. I love the way you're taught. Oh, so, so, so Jocko is brilliant at players as, as he was, and he was a true virtuoso, but he, did, he could not swing that way. He did not feel that. His is a more straight 16th. I mean, and what he, he did with that was phenomenal. But, you know, so I was left uh, under, I guess, a bit of a misunderstanding because the management called me. Uh, I said, I think they said, the management called one day and said, I think you need to know that Joe and Wayne were raving about your playing on Black Market, which felt really good. It's like, wow, okay. So when we come in to play the tunes for rehearsal, I'm playing it that way. And they're saying, well, no, that's not the feel. So, whoa, now I'm really confused. Oh, not knowing that it was because Jocko couldn't quite fit into that. Had they said to me, we're going to go with a different feel, I'd have been fine with that. That's what I've done all my life is play these wacky varieties of music, you know. But it didn't go down that way. Then it got very political, you know, um, with Jocko lobbying, you know, uh, you know, for, well, Minority was already out at that point. They decided they weren't what he did didn't quite fit. Uh, so then, I, you know, then they had, uh, then they brought in Manolo to play percussion and, and Alex moved over to drums and it, it didn't, it, it, I mean, since those days I've seen Joe and Wayne, I've seen Wayne a lot and, and he even apologized to me at one point. We had a really wonderful conversation about it all. I'm so happy to hear that because, you know, it, it sounds like management was running interference for Jocko, giving you mix, he, they were telling you one thing and then they just i don't know they it's so well, I, yeah I, I don't i don't know the inner workings of any of that but like i said as it turns out you know i've, I've run into wayne since and, and we've done we've been fine you know we've been absolutely fine since then um you know the documentary about wayne and a couple of the documentaries about you know about weather report and stuff i, I was spoken of very kindly by them so it wasn't like you know it it, it, it did not it, it did there wasn't this heavy negative thing going on. It was a very wonderful year of my life for touring with those guys, and I'll never forget it. Um, and, you know, basically, time does heal things, as they say. Um, but no, I mean, I've, you know, I was, I was a little, you know, a little bent out of shape at first, but, but you, well, you know, no, this is you know, so I mean, that's an amazing story. First of all, I, I, because I was watching this blazing <laughs> clip of you and Al Johnson with Weather Report from 73. And then I'm, also seeing Soundstage, which if you haven't seen that, it's like you are the most relaxed groove artist I've ever seen. I mean, that I was like, where is Chester, man? I was obsessed with this thing. But did you 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 played for more than a, a year on tour with them, right? It was a few years. Uh, it, it was just a year, 75. We, you know, the Berlin concert, the, wow. the, the thing that we, we recorded at, at NPR in Chicago, the thing you're talking about. Oh my God. There's also a radio clip from a club gig in Cleveland that's that's been around for a while um and yeah it was a busy year oh my goodness it was a really intense year right but you packed yeah, a lot in yeah exactly and then you know there's that the, the double album they released which not many people have heard called live and unreleased it's all the bands from 75 to 83 I think uh and it's it's amazing because it's all weather report but it sounds like five different bands it's incredible um and, you know, I've got a little pride moment because we had, you know, our band was like on five of the tracks. We won most of the tracks. We opened and closed that album, you know, with some stuff in the middle as well. Um, it's, but, the, it's, yeah. it's just been such the reason. And so the the reason I brought up, up Jocko is because, um, it were, you know, regardless of that, how all that played out. I mean, the the, the stories that I've been told from Alex Litcherwood. David Morgan, uh, mm. Narda. I mean, you know, Jocko completely fell apart. And I just, my, my question was actually, did you reach a point? What was the, what was the impetus? Was it just meeting your wife and, and you guys deciding to, to become Christian? I mean, I, or oh, was it a point where like you wanted to say you needed to save yourself from yourself? Okay. Um, a little bit of all of the above. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah. my wife and I met doing the whiz. 
Um, I, you know, after Weather Report, I did freelance, did a tour with the Pointer Sisters, did a ton of recording in LA, lots and lots of fusion records. Wow. Ended up, um, got a call uh, to do The Wiz. You know, the they'd opened a LA company of The Wiz from the New York show. And um, so I was, you know, went down and auditioned and, you know, I would, you know, especially having been in Zappa's band, the reading was certainly no problem, you know. <laughs> and, um, yeah, of course. Dude. You know, but but it was such a drummer's show. I mean, because I'd always wanted to do, do a Broadway show. I mean, I, I, you know, I love so many kinds of music. And and so I was really looking forward to it. Turns out I didn't do it in L.A. I ended up starting with them in San Francisco. Uh, it was a union issue because uh, I wasn't in the L.A. local. And um the, the guy who was doing the rehearsal drumming because they had to have a rehearsal drummer just like shows have rehearsal piano players mm -hmm. because it was so dance intensive that they needed a drummer at the rehearsals and the guy was lobbying for the gig but his reading wasn't very he had a great feel but he couldn't he didn't read well and and you know he couldn't understand why the music the music director wouldn't give him the gig and the guy kept telling me i need you to catch these licks and you you know you're not reading this stuff Anyway, the guy was did not appreciate my coming in and sight reading the thing and being offered the gig. And he had a feeling that I, he, he didn't know. He just thought this guy might not be in the union because I wasn't that long in the L.A. scene. You know, I've been on the road the whole time I'd been there between Zappa and Weather Report. Mm -hmm. And um, so he went to the union and sure enough, you know, whereas they were willing to kind of help me get in the union right away this guy had done a formal complaint so it, i didn't get in until it was about to leave la by then i'm i'm in the local oh. and um so i met my wife there she replaced dd bridgewater in in the Wiz, oh. and we just got to be friends we just hung out and were friends and then you know how it is one day i looked at her and she looked real different to me so <laughs> like, i love so, you know so we got together you know we married and stuff and um through a friend you know, uh, I was in, we were invited to go hear this guru. I don't even remember the guy's name at this point, which is you know, beside the point. So, you know, we did. We went and listened. And, and that stuff, I mean, all I guess there's always some element in truth of all, with all these things, you know, with all these sure. different things. And so we started, you know, listening and following the teaching of that. Um, we, I guess because of my notoriety or whatever it was known the groups i'd been with and by then i'm playing with genesis and stuff and we ended up being kind of taken into the inner circle kind of and we got to see the humanity of these people who were sort of selling it as being them being divine it was like this is not adding up you know um and then a dear friend abraham laborio senior the bass player are you kidding me dude abe laborio he is a dear soul uncle to me i, I just so saw abe, him at the Oh, Abe and I, Abe and I go back to 1971 when he was a student at Berkeley. Are you, dude? I okay. Continue. This is blowing because oh, I mean, and he he recorded on that Gary Burton album well when he was at Berkeley with. Uh, right. Well, so him and I, we ended up uh, doing a gig with this band I was playing with in Berkeley. I mean, not I wasn't at Berkeley. I was just living there playing with this band, band. What is this band? I need to know this band. Huh? What was this band? <laughs> well, the official name of it was the Post Pop Space Rock Bebop Band. <laughs> oh my! <God. laughs> it was a keyboard player from Baltimore, a guy named Webster Lewis, phenomenal organist, and you know um, he was a B three player. I mean, all the clubs on the East Coast had B threes in those days, and um, the band was phenomenal. But when he would he would booked a lot of college gigs, and he would always augment the band because he normally played bass on the keys, but. You know, he would uh, he was an arranger, you know, besides being a great player, he was a really good arranger. So he'd have these more expanded kind of arrangements for these college gigs. And Abraham got brought in and Abe and I showed up at the rehearsal. We were the first ones there. By the time everybody else got there, we were already almost wet from playing straight for a half hour straight. We were just this, going. This is, war this is making my day. This is making my year right. <laughs> this is warming my heart. So you guys just. And you guys were going like New England colleges tour. I mean, what kind of colleges was it? Oh uh, well, oh goodness, we played uh, Wellesley. We played um, what's the yeah the famous girl, late women's college. We played two, yeah. played a few schools up there. And then he had Webb had gotten me friends with Gunther, Gunther Schuler, the president of um, sure. New Conservatory, who did these uh, fundraising things where the subject would be on the history of jazz. And he would do a whole lecture on that, but we would be the band that would play, you know, for these things. 
And so, um, oh. yeah, these yeah, guys yeah. were pretty connected. This is insane. Wait, were there any horn players? I mean, I mean, to me, oh you... goodness, yeah, oh yeah, there was one guy, Marvin Peterson, who became Hannibal Marvin Peterson. Yes. And uh, one oh, guy passed dear. away. The original guy was Bobby Green. He passed away since then. And Stan Strickland came in at one point. Uh, yeah, that name rings a bell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a pretty heavy band. So, um, so basically, Abe. Abe, Abe and I were really close. And when he moved to L.A., he had become a Christian. And Abe came to the house, and he saw this picture of this guru on the wall. And, you know, first, he didn't say anything at first. When he, one day he comes over and says, my brother, this is not the truth. You know? mm. And so we talked and talked. And finally, one day he said, he came over and he was like, you know, as long as you have this thing here, I cannot come to your house anymore. And um, it really hit me deeply because he was one of my dearest friends. And um, by and by then, like I say, because we were getting to see behind the scenes, we were like realizing these people were not what they were portraying themselves to be. And uh, so Abe and his wife hosted a, uh, a a home group from the church they were a part of at the, at their house, which was open. You know, you didn't have to be a church member to go to that, but it would just be a time of of singing and fellowship and and dancing. You know, not dancing and teaching and stuff. And uh, we started going to that, and from the first day in, man, the, the feeling there was just phenomenal. And uh, and the teaching, you know, just, I mean, Abe, Abe LeBoyle might be uh, responsible for half of the Christian and believers in L.A. for coming, becoming Christians. You know what, and that, and you know what, part, we're better off, that, we're all better off for it, man. It's right, unbelievable. Part of, that, part, of that home, part of that home group was John Patitucci. <laughs> Wow. Nathan East was in and out for a while. Uh, yep. Alex Acuna, um, you know, <laughs> and in fact, uh, John Patitucci and I used to go play in we, what we call prison ministries. We'd go in prisons together and, you know, and, and play stuff and, and talk to the prisoners and stuff. I literally was just at the write off room and I, and I went up to Abe and I hugged him and he goes, Jake, I haven't seen you in a minute. It was since before COVID and he ripped off. I mean, the man is just so beyond. I, I mean, you are too. I mean, just I just know Abe personally, and I just I find him to be one of the most humble, brilliant, he's, loving he's, people. He's and, wonderful. <laughs> but you know, just to talk. So it sounds to me like that. Whatever that guru, it kind of became almost a cult kind of thing that was almost there was a lot of dogma, and you, yeah. you know, so there, some, there were several of those guys. There was, there, you know. And, you know, I mean, they would show us these videos and it'd be like a throng of thousands and thousands following behind them in the street and stuff. Wow. And that's part of their culture, because one day I saw a, a film clip of Muhammad Ali, you know, in India, riding on an elephant with thousands and thousands and thousands of people, you know, behaving the same way as when it was this guru thing. It was like, ah, OK, I get it. That's their culture. Wow. And. You know, and they encouraged us to read all the scriptures. So I ended up, oh goodness, I ended up studying, you know, the, the Bhagavad Gita and the book of Tao and, you know, Buddhism. I ended up studying all this stuff. The Bible is the only thing that really stood out and, and hit us deeply. And, um, you know, we, we they'd say only read these specific verses, but we didn't stop at that. We kept reading and learning more. Um, you know, I've been, like I say, since 1980, the last several years, I've, I read through the Bible, the entire Bible every year, wow. not straight through from page one to the end. It's like it's broken up into different sections. And, you know, it's like, it's just such a, it just gets you out of yourself. You, you realize, no, we it ain't about us, you know, wow. um, it's about living and serving others. And, you know, um, can I yeah, ask you it, something? It's just really interesting. I'm a, I received the Tao, uh, my my um my ex-wife Taiwan was Taiwanese, so I and our children <clears throat> when they were born, um I never I never got bar mitzvah or had any kind of confirmation. My mom mm -hmm. was Catholic, my dad was Jewish. But yeah. <laughs> when I received the Tao, it 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 changed me. Uh fundamentally, uh, so much of my habitual nature fell away and a lot of my true nature uh, came to the forefront. And I, it, I, you know, it, it coincided with me starting my show and I was able to find my voice. And I just I'm curious about <clears throat> being that you read all these spiritual texts. I sort of come from a more pantheonic point of view, but I wonder about if there was one pa <laughs> passage that you could point to that where you said the Bible hits you guys really hard authentically that you wanted to keep digging. 
And if there was one <laughs> thing that you could point to, because that's a profound statement, because the Dow mm -hmm. to me is not, a, it's not a, it's not a, it's a way of life. So I'm not right. going to pretend to know about, right. you know, but I wanted you to riff on it being that that seemed to resonate with you more than anything else. Okay. Well, okay. So, so there's one, you know, my wife is in the middle of writing a book, right? And it's almost complete. She's making her crazy. She's been working on it for years. Um, Cause at one point she was a worship leader at a church and, you know, I, I, myself and a couple other guys were like what they call the elders board and stuff. And so, you know, it, I mean, it, and I've never really been involved in any leadership other than that. Um, but she had to go had to go dive pretty deep to really, really do that well, you know. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see. So in those days when we were first reading, the one verse that kept sticking out to me that made no sense to me at the time uh, was a scripture that says, I, I send forth my word and it doesn't, re and it accomplishes what uh, the purposes I send it for and it doesn't return void. Mm -hmm. And that always puzzled me. That just puzzled me and puzzled me. Over the years, I've, I've realized that, okay, I get it now because we were being called and no matter what we went through or questioned, it's like, it's, it's you know, it, it has certainly come to that. Like you say, um, Christianity is not meant to be a quote religion. It's a, a relationship. I mean, well, I happen to believe what the Bible says. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can nitpick it and you can find errors because it, you know, it was given through men. I do believe this, this, the Spirit of the Lord led these men uh, to fully get some of it. You need to understand the culture of the times because some of the analogies and references are relating to those specific times. Not that human nature has changed. But it, it's about, it's more about, okay, we're all created beings, um, you know, what I believe, according to the Bible, that the creator himself, that the, I believe there is a creator, and that, you know, he has given us a, a, a manual, so to speak, on, on how to take care of this body, of how to be a human. Uh, you go out and you go buy a hundred thousand dollar automobile. You're probably going to pay attention to the manual, and <laughs> not try to not mess it up. Um, so I've lived this ridiculous, unlikely life, and seen over and over. I mean, oh goodness, being saved from danger, um, not knowing where the, you know, whether you can afford the next rent payment or whatever, and just never ever been left in the cold, so to speak, just, wow. you know, wow. everything works out at the moment. Um, I used to be the biggest worrier on the planet. I was like, you know, I mean, if I was in your band, you didn't have to worry. I took care of all of that. You, know? <laughs> you worried for everyone. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Um, you oh, know, cause I, I wanted things to be right. I was just kind of, but you know, to the point of silliness even, you know, so, yeah. I mean, I finally got, you know, had to learn better than that. And I've just learned to, you know, um, life works. I believe life is more than fair. I mean, and I've seen it the other way. I mean, I had a brother that was, that was strung out for several years. Um, I've grown up, one of the clubs I used to play in in Baltimore was a um, favorite hangout of, of uh, you know, sort of local sort of gangsters, the guys with the new Cadillacs every year. <laughs> and, you know, the absolutely dressing like they're out of uh, GQ. They did not absolutely. dress like the feathers totally. and the hats and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I've seen, you know, I've been given a lot of sort of human nature lessons behind from some of those guys because they sort of, would, you know, kind of loved our band and they kind of took me and I guess being a young guy or whatever. And um, I've just seen so much. Um, I've just seen it prove itself over and over and over in my life. Uh, I do believe I accept the thing of Christ that, you know, um, you know, uh, there's, you know, people question, well, you know, what's this whole uh, patriarchal kind of thing? Why why couldn't it have been a daughter as opposed to a son? Well, he came to die. He didn't, he didn't come to live a charmed life or anything, you know. Right, right. Um, and, it, you know, it's an incredible lesson in obedience and love. But if you grew up in the Jewish culture, you know, if you, you study it at any point, then you realize um, sacrifice was required you know, uh, you know, to compensate for, for the, for the sin or whatever. 
and I mean, a couple of people I've met that were missionaries were saying how much easier there it is in sort of third world countries, especially countries, especially where there's a jungle where people don't even live in civilization, they understand the concept of sacrifice. And so they get it, they get that, wow. that there has to be sacrifice, you know. Um, right. You know, so it's, no, you um, just said something really profound, though, because <clears throat> my older daughter is about ready to go to Princeton freshman year. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> you know, we've been talking a lot about resiliency. And I always, mm -hmm. you know, we say life isn't fair. But you just said life is very, it can, I think life is very fair. And I think that I that's do, a yeah. really profound, because I also think that God is always looking, because we're always getting knocked down. I mean, you've talked about some stories today that, you know, <laughs> it, it it's called resiliency. You, you have to overcome adversity. And that to me is, and if you do that, then you're not a victim and there's no self-pity and life is fair. I believe right. you're being watched and seeing how resilient you are. And I don't think, <laughs> I think that's the thing with you. You never quit. You ne No matter what was thrown at you, no matter, you never quit. And I do, <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure you've seen people check out because they have just had gotten too much resentment in their heart or had that thing that life isn't right. fair. And I'm, I'm never going to say life isn't fair anymore after today. <laughs> Well, okay. Uh, my wife used to have this little note thing on the counter. It used to make me so angry every time I saw this one little saying, and I think it was something to the effect of, "Never a calm sea, ne never a skilled sailor that a calm sea make." You know. Mm. So you. That's you right. Need, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you need the challenges to grow stronger. You know. I mean, it, you know, I'm 75 and it's like, you know, you, you realize, man, if you want your bones to stay strong, you got to lift weights. You know, you, you got to have resistance. You got to challenge yourself, you know. Um, you know, I mean, about uh, not what is this? We're in July. So in 2023, I woke up one day in January and went to get out of bed and couldn't stand up. And I'd been having issues prior to that, you know, uh, my legs, I, you know, was having a hard time walking and stuff. I've had three back surgeries. So, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I didn't know if it's, what, what is it's like now what's going on. And uh, as it turned out, I had ended up with something called tendinosis and the tendon off my right hip. And basically, oh. I had to learn how to walk again. I ended up in a rehab hospital using a walker, having to learn how to walk again. Oh, you know? my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it sounds pretty rough. <laughs> no, but you want to talk about res I mean, you at seven. I mean, that happened last year. Yeah. Okay. So here's the deal, though. Two years prior to that, I stopped working out. I stopped exercising. I've always played tennis. Uh, rollerblading was my go-to, even up until then. And um, wow. basically, I stopped doing anything. Really, I just sit around the house and reading or watching TV or not. I mean, I go play my drums, but. And but because the muscles weren't being continuously worked, you know, um, they just were no longer limber and loose and ended up almost blowing out the tendons off my right hip. Tendinosis is a repetitive motion overuse injury where the uh, tendons don't get a chance to recover properly. And, you know, basically, you know, you you can't stop moving. You can't, you know, you use it or lose it, you know. So, As, I'm, so I'm not, go ahead, please. So I've, I've had I've had over a year of some pretty intense physical therapy, right? In fact, <laughs> uh, after I came out of the rehab hospital, you know, I'm literally praying. You know, I've got to, I'm going to have to have home physical therapy. Please send me the right person because I'm getting like this amazing physical therapy in in this hospital. Who shows up? A drummer. That's a physical therapist. No <laughs> way. I love it. I you know, love so, it. And that, to me, that kind of stuff is not coincidence, you know. No, there are no coincidences, just right. No, so you know, I mean, and I've had like this Brazilian guy, this uh, uh, physical therapist since then, and we met. And first meeting, we talked a little bit about my condition, and we spent most of the time talking about our favorite Brazilian artist. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, and he didn't know my playing or who I was or anything, but but he so he was leaving to go on vacation that next day. Uh, so I saw a few other people. When he came back a couple of weeks later, he's like, okay, I've looked you up online. We got to get you playing again, you know. Um, and he came. Hey, you know, uh, I, I wanted to ask but, you something. You know? 
I mean, it's. It, I was going to ask you. It, it, do you, I, there's. I just have so much more to get to. We've been cooking here for an hour and fifteen minutes. Could could we do set two next week? That would be good because I got to go. I got to go and get my iPhone fixed. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I'll, I'll reach out. But let's set it because I mean, I, the one thing I wanted to ask you about the, to wrap up this. This it, it goes back to Baltimore because uh, we. Uh, it's been so enlightening just to. <clears throat> hear your stories and your wisdom, but I wanted to read this to you. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain this guy was somebody you crossed paths with, another Baltimore cat, Larry Willis. Larry who? Larry Willis. Okay. He, he, so I just, he, he was, he, he grew up in New York. He, he was living in Baltimore towards the end of his life, but um, he actually recorded on the same label, uh, Sonny Lester's label that O'Donnell recorded on with you, the Groove okay. Merchant. But this is what he said, and I want you to just think about this for the beginning of our next interview. He said, mm -hmm. <clears throat> he said, <clears throat> one of the great Brooklyn Dodgers married a lady who lived on my block, two blocks from the photo grounds. His name was Roy Campanella. People mm -hmm. like Campy and Sugar Ray Robinson had businesses in the community. My father used to own a garage and would park the cars of two New York Giants baseball players. One of them was so kind as to give me a baseball when I was 12 years old. His name was Willie Mays. I got a chance to meet Jackie Robinson in the lobby of the Apollo Theater. All of that is gone. And the real estate developers have put up housing there that the African-American community can no longer afford to live in. Culture and music stimulate the human spirit and the human intellect. If these attitudes are not allowed to move forward and persist, they're going to deny and destroy that energy that society must have coming from its culture. For me, quote unquote, jazz is just a label. I was trained in high school in traditional Western European music, but I grew up in a parlor. This music was available to that community seven nights a week. A lot of these places were within walking distance from my home. The music was there in the street, accessible to anybody who wanted to hear it. It was part of the neighborhood culture or the city culture at that particular point. This notion of integration is a very valid and moral principle, but by the same token, it is only a principle in principle if it doesn't work. Subsequently, clubs like Count Basie's and Connie's and Smalls Paradise and Club Baron, that music ended up moving downtown. It denied the community it existed. It existed in access to this music. These places are either grocery stores now or restaurants and have no connection with the legacy and the culture of the past. The music has moved downtown into areas where the people who inhabit that community don't travel. They can't afford it economically. I went to the Manhattan School of Music um, from the High School of Music and Art. There was a trumpet player. Oh, so this goes on. I mean, the point is that what he was saying was, if you take the culture out of society, that's how you get another Hitler. And I'm just saying that, like, without getting really political, even in Baltimore, uh, the, the the bandstand, uh, Ethel's Lounge, uh, Gary's Club. I mean, I just kind of want you to think about the idea of so much of even your career started, all the great music came out of the community. And to me, it's so hard now um, because you have a, you, it's not that you're not developing. I know you have students and there's many amazing uh, musicians coming out and there's just not enough places to play. So we have a, a, we have a supply and demand issue. And I just kind of want you to think about for the next, among other things, uh, just the idea of how um, people that don't know how to do anything else other than play music can really sing for their supper in the modern era. Hmm. Wow. You know, because it's, you know, to me, it's just, I, I, I'm sure you look back on it. It's a little Pollyannish. I mean, but still 13 years old, you're on the bandstand in a bar that just wouldn't happen today. And yet that happened all the time. And, and, um, being on the road and, and yet there was still, it was always, it's always been a racket. It's always been, a, the industry has never been kind. Um, but now, I mean, I just, with my peers and younger generations, it's, I don't know. I'm never going to stop my show Chester until a musician is, I mean, a, a, a live musician, not playing in a big band like tower of power, or, you know, Steve Miller band or journey, uh, but just 
a live touring musician, I mean, he's a live gigging musician, hasn't gotten a cost of living increase since 1984. Wow. You know, and so these are just things I want to brainstorm because ultimately you guys are connected to the lineage of the Jimmy McGriffs and the Jack McDuffs and the Dizzy Gillespie's and the, the Bill Monroe's of Bluegrass and the Little Richards and all these cats. And um, it's that charisma that's going to lead us back to understanding the significance of how I started my monologue about how mm -hmm. rhythm can can save us. Because I, I I I worry about the direction we are heading as a, as a as a civilization. Wow. Oh boy, you. Uh, <laughs> you hey man, you know, forward, honestly, man. dude, we hit this out of the park, dude. Chester, honestly, man, bless you, man. I had such a great time, and and we'll text and figure out a, a time to do set two. Yeah, we, yeah, you've you've hitting on you're hitting on some some pretty pretty intense. I'll send you a few interviews to listen stuff. to. Yeah, I'll send you some interviews. Uh, the my Covington interview is really special. There's a few more that I want you to check out too. I'll send them along. Great, great. Uh, and, I, yeah, and I do, and I do love your. I, I love your new CD, by the way. I, I was listening oh, to it Thank last you. night. Really Thank cool. You. Wow. Yeah, there's a story behind that. We can get into that later, but just just very quickly. Yeah. Every song, every song started with just a raw drum track. <laughs> it feels very raw. It feels good. The it, the it feels good uh, to me. Like that's what Ndugu Chancellor said to me. He goes, "I can go to a clinic and see some guy playing like." with facility beyond this world and I wind up falling asleep because it's, it, I'm bored, <laughs> you know? And what I heard on those tracks is, is that it, it feels good. It, it just feels good. And so that's the most important thing because no one's ever going to really remember what you said. They're going to remember how you made them feel. Mm, that's it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, man, I've enjoyed. Hey, speaking man, you. bless you, man. Uh, let, let me know what, what, you know, let's figure Let me know. What time works for you and we'll figure that out all of that out and um man god bless you um yeah i look forward to, to talking again <laughs> absolutely man have a beautiful day man okay you too man all right Jake. take care bye man all right bye-bye